<clears throat> so non neovascular dry macular generation, which we have constantly in conference. Um, the uh, this is mostly out of your book, but you need to know this. Leading cause of blindness in people over 50 in the developed world. In North America, there's about 15 million people with dry AMD. About 10% of people with dry get wet. So if you just divide all the dry numbers by 10, you'll get the wet numbers. There's about 200,000 new cases of AMD in, in the US a year, wet AMD. Um, so to separate, it's important to know when you're dying, it's important to be able to delineate who has a disease and who doesn't for all sorts of purposes, research and also treatment. So there is normal aging. So normal aging, you lose photoreceptors starting, I believe, at our age, or your age even. So you lose some photoreceptors every year. You lose your melanin in your RPE, and your RPE uh, increases the lipofuse skin. That builds up the lipofuse skin over time. Brooks membrane develops deposits, um, and this is Brooks membrane here. So here you've got Brooks membrane, the RPE cells, and the melanin. Uh, the retinas would be up there. Brooks membrane develops deposits, and then the chorocapillaris thins. So that's all normal aging. And you'll see people, I, I have this every day, or at least every other day, I'm talking to a 96, 95 to 100 year old patient about why they can't see well. And you're trying to say nicely, you're just 95 to 90 to 100 years old, but it's normal for people to lose vision as they get older. Um, risk factors for AMD, the main one is age, and there's there's been probably a half dozen studies almost, big epidemiologic studies, all showing the same numbers. So from 65 to 75, about 10% of people will get AMD. 75 to 85, it's about 25%. Over 85, it's about 50%. So the first one was the Framingham study, and then I think the Beaver Dam, and then the Rotterdam study. Um, so that's the big one is age. So it's almost impossible. Because people will always ask you also as a doctor why something happened. Everybody wants to make, actually, Dr. Glodner, when I used to tell people it was bad luck, and then people were saying I was being flippant. So even though I had a serious face, so I just say it, it, things just happen in medicine. So as you get older, this happens. Cigarette smoking is the other huge risk factor. So especially current smoking. The other ones are are I do not consider big risk factors, but they're all right out of your basic science book. <laughs> so there's hypertension is a little bit hypercholesterol, cardiovascular disease, a family history hyperopia, light iris, and race. It's actually mostly a Northern European thing. So we see a lot of macular generation. I have a friend who has a huge practice in Puerto Rico, Maria Baracol, and they don't see much down there. She's mostly diabetes. So it's mostly kind of a Northern European white person thing. Excuse me, sorry. I had an African-American lady who came in with classic dry AMD, and people were very nervous because her retina looked funny. And she had done that 23 in me, and she said she was mostly Northern European. So it's kind of fun. So, uh, so it's mostly a Northern European thing. There's a lot of genetics with AMD. There's 19 genes that are associated. There's, a lot of them are in the complement cascade, which was interesting, and still I don't think we completely understand that. So there's something inflammatory or immune. Um, and then lipid transport, extracellular matrix, and the other ones. The two main ones, though, were these two. The CFH, uh, the complement factor H mutation, and then this other one, which is a mitochondrial gene the ARMS2, and you can test for the, there's been studies showing that these increase your risk tremendously of developing dry AMD. If you have homozygous of both of those genes, you've got a 50-fold increase of, in developing dry AMD. So do I, have I, I've never tested anybody for <laughs> genetics because the AAO says that you shouldn't, and I don't think it's necessary, and I don't really want to do things that are unnecessary, and also it's just a hassle. But they, the current recommendations for genetic testing are Mendelian traits, so you should test for, you know, some retinitis pigmentosis or Stargardt's and things like that. Um, and you do testing and counseling, and then you've got to use the right labs. You're supposed to give a copy to the patient and avoid direct consumer, direct to consumer testing, and avoid tests for things like macular degeneration, glaucoma. Um, there's another camp that says you should. Some and the difficulty with the camp that says you should is that a lot of them are are uh, possibly financially motivated. So there's an issue with a lot of doc. There's a number of doctors that do entrepreneurial things, and they'll own they'll own the labs, they'll they'll own the rights to the test, and they'll say it's very important. There are some weird papers out there that suggest that your genetic testing can help you tell people whether or not to take vitamins. And so, but a lot of people think those aren't very accurate, and there's a whole problem with all the genetic testing. So you'll see this with genetic testing, and um, again, this is. 
part of your basic science course um, for macro generation, but I don't, I don't do it. I've never done it. And I have to say, people don't ask for it much. I've had rare people ask for it. Every once in a while, some retina person somewhere runs an advertising campaign or they'll be at the mall doing testing and people, my patients will start asking for it. And then it, this is faded, which is nice. Um, characteristics of non-neovascular AMD, the big one's Drusen. And then the second one's abnormalities of the RP, which is very vague, because very few people have RP that looks normal. So there are specific abnormalities. The focal pigmentation, which we saw in that patient earlier, non-geographic atrophy, which is kind of depigmentation, and then geographic atrophy. Those are the three. And I dug around on this to try to find specifics for you to help you, so you don't have to look at everything and say, is that AMD? So, and you said earlier you can call it AMD just based off of that? That picture or those findings? I guess in the earlier earlier case you said yeah. this is AMD. Because the pigment spot. There was a pigment spot within a disc diameter of the center of the fovea, okay. which is defini which, which is definitional for AMD. Gotcha. In the absence of other diseases, and I wouldn't say pattern dystrophy is enough of a different disease at this point. Okay. And how do you define non-geographic atrophy? Light areas. There's kind of but light. The OCT leak. will show atrophy to RP. The OCT will show those. I have this. The call, it's called now nascent geographic atrophy. I call it non geographic but it's the areas where the light goes through. That's what I was trying to show that on that one scan of the macular but the, It's not just a co. Uh, so ge isn't geographic atrophy just a um, what's the word coalescence of non geographic atrophy? No, no. Geographic atrophy can be small. So geographic. Uh, I. I have another case I'll show later, but non-geographic atrophy is just the RPs thinning out. So I'll try to show okay. that, but it's just thin. Yeah, um, a lot of times, when I first started my retina rotation, I'd see a lot of previously documented RPE changes. Right. They're very ambiguous and super ambiguous. Is that just? I try to get an answer for, to it. But how, how would you define that? RPE yeah, R, I don't like the word RPE changes because it suggests a change over time. And it's in all the books and it's in our charts, so we'll say RPE changes, but it's a weird way to say things. You don't say people have you know, skin change, I guess, abnormal RPE. So I think what they're trying to say is it's abnormal, and in the way it's abnormal, there are specific ways for AMD that you look for. And there's specific areas. You don't get very far. So this is someone with calcified drusen, but I have some pictures where it shows the sort of focal hyperpigmentation. Depigmentation's a little bit harder. Um, and that's it really. And then the geographic atrophy where you just lose the RP. It's not, it's a challenge. So drusen, so your classic drusen, which is, which is most drusen you'll see are under the RP. That's what this is supposed to show. So there's the RP and there's the drusen underneath it. So your drusen are supposed to be under the RP. And then this is supposed to also show this, these deposits that develop, the basal laminar and basal linear deposits. And that's sort of your classic histopathology for RP. So drusen are small, round, yellow, post-equatorial lesions. They should be within, if you're calling it for macular generation, should be within two distal diameters of the center of the macula. So it really needs to be in the macula. It can't be at the edge. Um, you see thickening of Brooks' membrane on histopathology. We can't image, I wouldn't be surprised if eventually people are trying to segment on the OCT. And at the moment, you can't segment out Brooks. You know, people are trying to, there's been some papers that I think are published, because I reviewed one, um, on trying to give the RP thickness for plaquenol toxicity. And that would be very nice, rather than saying, oh, I see, like those cases today, if you could have segmented the RPE, you would have no, immediately seen the areas where it's thin or not. But it's not quite there, but I think it will be eventually. Um, and then the basal laminar and basal linear deposits are classic for AMD, and I think that's just something someone might ask you someday. Um, so Drusen does have symptoms, so it's not just uh, findings. You'll have people who have decreased vision, decreased contrast sensitivity, decreased color vision, and decreased dark adaptation. And the, the, the thing which we've ne I've never done, and I would love to do, is test for those. We, in studies, we'll do that. So we always check vision. We always check visual acuity. And Snell and visual, you'll have patients every day where they'll come in with 20-20 or 20-30 vision and they'll say, you know, I know my, and my vision's normal, but my vision's getting worse. You know, I know it says I'm normal, but I'm getting worse. You always say I'm normal, like for five years I've had people coming in very upset, and so you can't invalidate a patient's feelings. So what you have to say is I understand, but it's other things. It's contrast sensitivity, we just don't test for it. And color vision, dark adaptation. And contrast sensitivity, is like losing your black purse on your black couch. 
And so people have that, and that's helpful because if you have people with macular degeneration, you're trying to help them live their life easier. You can say, you know, one of the things the occupational therapist will do is set up a high contrast environment. So they'll say, you know, white place, white place mats, black. No, I think white plates on a dark place mat. You know, that sort of thing where you can see your food, you can see everything, and it helps. It helps everybody. This is a lot of small stuff. So Drusen characteristics. When you point to a Drusen, you should be able to say, is it small, intermediate, and large? And this is in here twice because it, it's on all the, all the classifications use small, intermediate, and large. As small is less than 64. I think less than or equal to 60. No, less than 64 microns. I don't know where that came from. Intermediate is 64 to 124, and large is greater than 125. A Drusenoid PED is greater than 350 microns. And I have seen somewhere the 250 number for very large trees. So those are all sort of sizes, and you, you can measure them on your cameras now, and you can measure them on the OCT if you want to, if you want to pick up that little thing. I don't think you've done that. You pick up that little <coughs> measure, um, or you can just look at them compared to a vessel. All, all the trees in sort of attach the RB. They do. So, so it's not considered a Drusen IPD unless they're 350 for, doc, for diagnostic problems, mm -hmm. diagnostic purposes. Um, so that one in the middle probably, on this picture, that probably is just about 350. That one would be a Drusen IPD. But this wouldn't be a Drusen IPD, and that probably wouldn't either. Those would just be Drusen. Um, and then your boundary is important. So you've got hard Drusen, soft Drusen. These are confluent. And then refractile, like that one we showed, that were crystalline, that were calcified, and then reticular is a whole other group, which has not really been bought. This hasn't been bought together. Someone's got to synthesize all this, and I don't think it's been sufficiently done. And the reticular are totally different. So the drusen are under the RP, the reticular are in front of the RP. Which, and it's hard to say what that means because drusen. Do I say anywhere where they? I don't say where they come from. So drusen are, are digestive material from the outer segments. And, it, and the RP ingests the outer segments, and then it makes this, that stuff builds up underneath them, which is drusen. But the drusenite deposits are something else. They're something which doesn't get into the RP, so it's a totally different thing. So reticular drusen are totally different. Um, and then RP abnormalities. So focal hyperpigmentation, which I'll show you some pictures of. Non-geographic atrophy is, is like non-contiguous little areas of thinning or modeling, and then geographic atrophy is contiguous. You can unmask the choroidal vessels. You have outer retinal atrophy, thin choriocapillaris. It tends to spare the phobia into late, and it coalesces over time. These are all the same patient, which, is, which shows you that the color picture, the IR, and the autofluorescence show you totally different things. So on a color picture, it's kind of hard to see geographic atrophy, but once you look at the other pictures, you can go back to the color and you'll see it. And then the autofluorescence is helpful a little bit for prediction, and I think the IR shows geographic atrophy very nicely. Um, and then, okay, so then I've got a bunch of cases. I pulled three cases just from the last week or two before the lecture, because this is so frustrating. This is a patient I saw, an 81-year-old, the vision starts at 2032 in the good eye and then ends up at 2100. So this is the patient on 2011, and you can see that area down to your left, which is atrophic, but if you look at the rest of it, it looks pretty good. And then by 2012, there's this little patch of atrophy starting up here, and then the other one. And then if you look at it, it's 2018 now, they just grow. It's not that long a period of time. So that's over five years. No, that's over, that's to 2015. Yeah, so that's over, yeah, four years. So these patches of atrophy really grow and spread, and you're like, you're helpless. It just, they just grow, spread, and take away people's vision. And that's what the lampalizumab treat trial was trying to stop, but it didn't work. Would you call that two areas of focal atrophy? Yeah, like, what geographic atrophy. Would you call atrophy. it like, like large geographic atrophy? Though? Yeah, I call it like large. Discrete. I've never seen a large versus small geographic atrophy, because we do call them large and small. I don't know where the cutoff is. But um, I would call those large geographic atrophy. So phobial, uh, juxtap juxtaphobial, extraphobial, probably, mm -hmm. probably that one's juxtaphobial, large patches of geographic atrophy. And then they do slow down when they get toward the center, but they don't stop. So it's probably not, and there's a rate of growth, which I looked up before the lecture, but I forgot. I think it's about a disc area a year is the average growth, but I'm not positive. Um, and then typically we use autofluorescence. This is an 82-year-old man with geographic atrophy. 
This is somebody who probably has a pattern distribute type MAC of generation because the geographic atrophy starts in the middle. This is someone who was in one of our trials for a systemic treatment for dry AMD as this is happening. So it's 20, so I don't know if that trial, I, they, maybe they're getting placebo. So this is 2015, the vision's good. And then this is 2016, it's getting a little worse. And you see that patch in the middle that's sort of dark with a bright spot in the middle. And now they've got this, whatever shape that is, kidney shape, bean shaped area of atrophy in the middle in the next year. And then it gets bigger and then it gets bigger. And this is three years. So the person goes from good to bad over three years. It's very frustrating. But that one's different because it's dead center. And I think these are pattern dystrophies. And then this is a guy I just saw. Yeah, no. it's, it's also different that the RP are just completely gone here, right? Compared to the other one. The other one, they were still present, but just sort of. Like, this is dead, but this is autofluorescence. The other one was IR. Okay, okay. So autofluorescence is better for looking at function. Okay, it's so true, if it's black, it's dead. Okay. And then this is a three-year-old, this is his better eye. I just saw him two days, no, yes, yeah, a couple days ago. This was 2013, it, and this is, you can look at this, it's just horrible, it just grows, 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 and squeezes off the center. One thing I can tell you that's tricky is reading the center for geographic atrophy from autofluorescence because of the foveal pigment. So what happens at this point, I think it's very hard to tell when that center goes. It looks like they're still there if you look real hard at it. But the OCT is better for looking at geographic atrophy in the very late frames. And there are a number of geographic atrophy trials. And this is the guy I saw yesterday. This is a little more, these are all a little different. So this person, if you look at the, the other thing is predicting geographic atrophy's progression. You see how it's bright on the edge? So bright on the edge means it's probably going to progress. But I would not have thought this would progress as, as aggressively based on the brightness on the edge isn't that striking. But this patient here, the RPE is just bright everywhere. You see how it's all hyper, hyper autofluorescence? And then there are all these patches. And what you'll see, what you typically can do on these people is draw a circle around everything that's bright, and that usually goes dead. And this person, they just come together. So this was 2014, 15, 16, 16, 18. And now the central vision's gone when they came in the other day. And it'd be really nice to stop that, but we don't have anything yet. So that's all geographic atrophy. And that's the 10% the of patients with dry AMD will lose vision from geographic atrophy. So if you, if you run the numbers, 10% of people with AMD get wet, 10% of AMD do get severe dry, so it's the same size problem. So it's the same magnitude problem, it's vision loss from geographic atrophy as from wet AMD, which is why everybody's trying to find an answer. Now, I, t I tell you, I, look, I read for probably two weeks on the ARED study trying to get this straight in my head to tell you. So here's my, my understanding of the ARED study, and I think it's finally correct, and I don't know that I knew all this before. So these are the Drusen size. You've got the less than 63 diameters, but again, within two days, standard center of the macula is small, intermediate is greater than 63, less than 125, and large is greater than 125. So there's a thing in AREDS, which is in your course, which is called extensive Drusen. So you get to be called macular generation if you have a lot of small or a lot of intermediate drusen toward the middle. This is a young patient I had with cuticular drusen. I just put the slide in because I couldn't find any early ones because I usually don't see them. Um, but this would not be considered AMD despite all the drusen. It's sort of on the edge. I was trying to find pictures on the edge. There's a bunch of small drusen near the center, but it's probably not enough small drusen to consider it extensive. So. And then pigment abnormalities, I want to tell you. So pigment abnormalities for AREDs have to be very close to the center of the phobia. So for drusen, it's two disc diameters. For depigmentation, it's one disc diameter. So you pretty much have to be right next to the phobia, either hyperpigmentation or depigmentation. If it's farther away, you don't get credit for it for macular generation. And this is a patient that had a hyper hypopigmented area right next to the phobia there. And I have to say, a lot of these patients, to me, the pigment patients, I think they're more pattern dystrophy. I think they're all glumped together. But, um, and so then there's AREDS category. So I'm going to do two things. And this, I'm sorry, this is, this is just the way it is. There's AREDS categories, and then there's AREDS risk factors. So AREDS categories were the inclusion criteria. So there was category one, which was no drusen or small drusen, not extensive drusen. Category two was one or more intermediate drusen, a lot of small drusen or pigment abnormalities in either eye, but not all of them. Uh, category three was one or more large drusen, 
20 or more intermediate trees are non-central geographic atrophy, and category four is central geographic atrophy. So category four is late, so there's central divisional, ge central geographic atrophy or neovascularization. Category three is kind of severe, be considered like more severe with the large trees, and then category two and one are, are milder. The reason it's important because there was no benefit in the study found for category one and two. So if you look at the way the AREDS was done, there's no benefit. I think I read that because it was just underpowered. It wasn't that they saw that it didn't do anything conclusively. It was powered pretty good. It might have been. A, I, the, the other the gigantic problem with the A red study is it was color fundus photos. When they because I've been in practice since it started before it started, I thought it was going to be negative. So when they started the A red study, I was saying you know take vitamins. We'll probably know in a couple of years you don't have to. But. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so the a -red, so my problem with a -red studies is the color fundus, because I can show you probably 20 fundus photos of people who have wet AMD and you don't see it on the fundus photos. I don't care how good you are. So they had a reading center, so it was all photograph driven. There's no fluorescent angiography. It was prior to autofluorescence. It was prior to OCT. And I, you know, we see it all the time. So that's the, that's the like huge thing. It might have been a little underpowered. I haven't heard that particular one. but. But the main thing is it's just fundus photos, which is really tricky. Do you give A reps to, to small drusen people? No, I try, I wouldn't. I just call them drusen. I have a thing in my chart, I have a thing in my macros for my medical records on drusen. So I can say, I can mention drusen is not AMD. People don't like that macro, macro generation freaks people out. Um, so early, intermediate, and late is another categorization of AMD. I just put in here because this is, I think, also in your book, but also people use it. So normal is small drusen only or equatorial. Early is medium size, no pigment. Intermediate is large drusen and pigment. And then late is neovascular. Or any geographic attribute is considered late. And then the AREDS risk score is another thing. So there's AREDS categories, which were the inclusion criteria. And then there's the AREDS risk score, which is totally different. And the AREDS risk score is that one, two, three, four thing. So it's, you get maximum of two points per eye, and you score two points for wet AMD or central geographic atrophy. So if you have central geographic atrophy or wet AMD in one eye, you get two points for that. And then if you don't have that, you look for one or more large drews or pigment abnormality. Each of those gives you a point. That's as simple as I think you can do it. So one drews, it doesn't, this is not a, this, the AREDS risk score doesn't have anything for uh, a bunch of, what I call it, um, for um, extensive. Extensive is not in the AREDS risk category. It's the one or more large drews or pigment is one, is that's one, two, and then wet AMD or central atrophy gives you another two. So if it's non-central atrophy, that's one. So then you go through. So, and then this can give you your risk of developing <coughs> AMD in one eye over five and 10 years, which does go up. I mean, if you look at the category four, it's 50 to 50%. 50 we'll get that in, um, in five years, which is a lot of people. Um, three points get you a 25%, two points get you 12, and then, it's interesting, that's about exactly the same as the age groups for AMD, which is the 10, 25, and 50. You can put that all in your head together in one spot. Um, and then the other ones are very low risk. <coughs> and then there, I did find a, a risk calculator online which was interesting. I just was Googling everything. And there is a risk if you want to put in an AMD. And it's got some other things in it. It's got age, it's got a couple other things, and I'll give you a risk. Do you do this in your head when you're doing the DFE? You know? No, I tend to tell people there's a 10 or 20% risk of vision loss. I can tell you, though, the big finding on AREDS, the, one that I, the two things I keep in my head from the AREDS study, which I'm hoping are correct, because I'm telling you. One is, for the people with wet AMD in one eye, the vitamins reduce the risk of late AMD in the other eye by 50%. So that's a, those people really should be on the vitamins. If they've got wet or central GA in one eye, the, that's a gigantic risk reduction in the other eye. The other one is that in all comers, the vitamins reduce the risk by 10%, I think it was. But if you look at that, I believe it was the vitamin group had 10% of people progressing to late and the non-vitamin group had 8% progressing to late. And if you subtract those percentages, you get like a 10 or 20%. But if you look at the real thing, it's not a big reduction. So the main thing for me is if they got one eye wet, I really push them yeah, otherwise. So here's an AREDS score one. Yeah. Do you know any cheap source for AREDS too? Because all, uh, some of the patients that I've, I've, I've had on them, 
they all complain that it's 30 bucks a month and then whether yeah. they really want to do it or not. And I have a sheet I made up for my patients because I started about four or five, or actually 2011, seven years ago. Started seven years ago. I went to the pharmacy and I took pictures of all the different vitamins that were eye vitamins and then I put the formulas. And this is when I had free time. And um, I think any vitamin's fine. I am not an A Reds 2 person. So I, I, Walmart has an Equate vitamin that I think is $5 for a two month supply. And Walgreens has a generic. The other thing, my other gripe with vitamins is there's a USP seal that says the vitamin's been verified and a lot of the brand name ones don't have that. So like I got Centrum Silver. I thought I'm a doctor, why not get Centrum Silver? You know, I make more money now. And it didn't have a USP seal, so I just threw it away. So I got the generic, I got the Costco vitamins. So, and the other thing to tell your people is that all these vitamins, they're not, um, the main ingredient is not um, lutein. The only thing that's been shown helpful is zinc. Lutein's never been proven to do anything. So the main thing that's been proven to, to decrease the risk of max generation progression is zinc. To my knowledge, no one knows why that's true. It's an interesting story. There's always interesting stories. If you dissolve somebody, their mo the eye has mostly got a lot of zinc in it. For some reason or another, your eye's got an enormous amount of zinc in it. And it's not copper, what is it, zinc, copper oxide, super, super oxide dismutase is one of the main zinc. Um, zinc oxide. Yes, yeah, zinc. But that's not it. It's, it's, it, people have checked that. I actually did some work on it a long time ago. So it's something about zinc. The eye loves zinc. And the other thing was the guy that did the study, there's a guy, Newsom, who was here briefly. He did it in 1988, was the initial zinc study. And they did a placebo-controlled study of zinc and macular generation with no basis for it. And they got a positive result. And that was the reason for the AREDS. It was so weird. And I talked to him in a meeting once. I was like, why did you do that study? And he said, well, so we, like, there was something like urine findings. Like, there's no animal model, no preliminary studies. It went right to a large placebo-controlled study of zinc. But it was interesting, and they found a result. And then the other thing about zinc is there is an issue possibly, and again, this is possible, about zinc and cognitive function in the old people. So if someone's got cognitive function issues, or um, I tell them, I usually don't put them on the vitamins. So, All right, so what do you think this one is for, what, kind of, what classification would this be for AREDS? Do you think one, two, three, or four? So large fusions, so that'd be immediate. In both eyes. Yeah. So what is it? Intermediate or three? Three. So this would be three, I think. Two. I said two. Because uh, there's no oh. pigment. No. So a reds are score would be two. Oh, A reds category. Okay, so I did the risk score first. So the risk score would be two because there's no pigment. So it's just drusen in each eye, no late AMD, no pigment. So they get one point for each eye. So the risk score is two. The category is three. So because they have. Um, a bunch of pretty big drusen, that's three. And so their risk in category three in five years was 25% of developing wet AMD. So, so the, and this is somebody where the vitamins might help because it's intermediate and a large, intermediate risk because, oh, and then as far as those immediate, the, the um, early, intermediate, and late, this would be intermediate because there's large drusen. So those are, so your risk score would be two, category would be three, I don't know, hopefully you don't need to remember this. Oh, sorry, here's another one. So this is someone who's got wet MD in the other eye, In this eye it looks like this. And I thought it was a risk score of four, I'll just do these right, because there's pigment and um, drusen. Some of these I think are very small drusen. I can't, like, I would say, like, that's probably a drusen right there, and there's pigment. And then AREDS category would be four, so supplements are going to reduce the risk by 50%, and then it's... Um, intermediate as far as this eye is intermediate so that's the thing when you're doing the when you when I do my coding I have to pick out for the diagnosis early intermediate or late AMD in the eye and realize the AREDS classification and AREDS risk score are both eyes that's what I'm trying to tell you so each eye so this eye is intermediate because it's got pigment spots so hopefully that's helpful Okay, then the other thing, so this is all color fundus photos, AREDS, which is still important, but I wish it would, something would supplant it, but nothing has. So this is uh, imaging and dry AMD. So when you look at OCTs, there are other things we look at other than just drusen. We look at drusen, we look at PEDs, we look at atrophy, but there are these other three things I want you to know. One is hyperreflective foci are probably very important 
And does anybody see one of those on the top? Just look, look, see where you think it is, and then I'll circle it. Right between the gems. Put the magic in. Isn't that cool? So that's a. Uh, so those are hyperreflected foci. If you look at hyper, that's probably pigment migrating through the retina, and there's a five-fold increase of that turning into geographic attribute two years. So often those foci, and it makes sense because it's the pigment, like moving, it's going, it's detaching, so you're losing your pigment. So that tends to pre precede geographic atrophy. Reticular pseudoderms, we talked about, they're in front of the RPE instead of behind it, which is the wrong side. And then those people have a very high, that's what uh, Dr. Finlay was saying, have a much higher risk of progressing to late AMD with the reticular drusen. My take, just non-published with a lot of patients in my office, is that it's age-related. It's much more, the age, you see, I, I don't think you could find me a 90-year-old who doesn't have reticular drusen. I think it's just something you get as you get older. And it's a, it's a, and then nascent geographic atrophy, what I was trying to show on that one is when you see the light going through. So you don't necessarily see the atrophy, but you see the transmission of the um, light from, you see you're seeing more detail on the OCT deeper, and that's considered nascent geographic atrophy. Those areas within a year will often develop geographic atrophy. So that's imaging. And then pattern distributes your main masquerade. We went over one. I think this might be the same case. It tends to come on younger. It's symmetric variable. There's reticular and butterfly and then adult the telefarm. You get this classic yellow pigment spot. And pattern distribute tends to be right in the center. You get OCTs in front of the RP and they hyperfluoresce. And this was that case we should. Um, management, AMS are grid checking. <coughs> Thank God for electronic charts, because people used to get sued for not telling people to do all these things. But with electronic charts, it's all in there, whether you say it or not. So AMS are grid checking. Check each eye separately. There is a 4C home monitor that's been FDA approved, but it's very hard to get people to do it. But it isn't, if someone wants to check, that's a way they could get a, check themselves at home. If they don't see well, make sure to send them for a low vision evaluation, because it can be life changing. And the low vision people do know things. And then lifestyle changes for smoking cessation, obesity reduction, blood pressure control. I was trying to explain to somebody the AMS are great yesterday, and it just was not. She had a, one of those asymptomatic lesions that I don't treat and everybody else does. She had a wet lesion away from the phobia, totally asymptomatic. And I was trying to get her to follow it. I've been following it for about three to six months. It hasn't changed at all. And she was she clearly didn't know how to do the answer grid. Because you know what you we tell someone to look for distortion on, on a like if I told you to look for dirt in this room, you would look around the room. You don't stare at the middle of the table and try to look for dirt. So when you tell people to look for things, they look around, but the grid you can't do that. So what I finally told her was I was trying to explain it, and she wasn't getting it. So I said, Well, if you look at the TV, we have these TVs across the room, you could see if someone comes in and out of the door. So that's what you're trying to tell them to use their peripheral vision. So I would say, tell people, like, look at, like, look at me. You could tell if someone's swinging a baseball bat at me. So you can see things around. So they want to look at the dot and take in the grid. It's a lot to explain. And then micronutrients, like I said, the A-reds has the zinc, and then it's got vitamin C and E and beta carotene. Reduces the risk of progression. And then A-reds 2 is the same thing, but they switch the beta carotene for lutein and zeaxanthin. The beta carotene does have an increased risk of lung cancer. That was being tested because people thought it would reduce the risk, but it increased it. Um, this was a non-inferiority trial, so no one's ever shown AREDS2 is better than AREDS, and no one has ever shown AREDS is better than anything else. So the AREDS was placebo-controlled with nothing, and the AREDS2 was, was those two formulas. So I believe that, in my heart, that the formulas that are super cheap that just give you a bunch of zinc are fine. Um, and then lifestyle changes, get them to stop smoking, obesity reduction, blood pressure control. Most of my patients with wet AMD stop smoking when they start losing their second eye. I've almost had nobody stop it with the first eye. There's some evidence that the smoking makes them resistant to treatment. There's nicotine was such a, um, smoking so bad for your eyes that there was a time people were actually working on nicotine antagonists possible for macular degeneration. So the other thing I tell them is they need to stop smoking without patches and stuff. I'm losing my voice. I think we're done. Oh, disproven treatments or macular laser, which I still had someone do on one of my patients about 10 years ago. Rheophoresis, which was here. It's a Pinellas County, Florida thing where they filter the blood and lampalizumab, unfortunately, didn't work. If your patients come in for goofy macular generation treatments, mostly they cost five to $10,000. So, so if someone says, oh, I go to this vision training thing, do you think that's helpful? I used to say, you know, it's probably not gonna hurt you, but now I say, how much does it cost? 
and they'll say, oh, it's, you know, it's like $15,000, but they have a lot of people that they made better. And I always say, you know, there's not really any evidence. I ask them if they need to buy a bridge. Yeah, it's, it's, it's hard. I used to say, I can't even say what I used to say. I'll tell you when I turn the camera off. But. <laughs> <laughs> Did you say it's the nicotine or other stuff? It's thought to possibly be the nicotine. No one knows, but it's, it's, it's the cigarette smoking's bad for you, but there's some evidence the nicotine might be the culprit. So I try to get people to stop without the nicotine supplements, just for that specific. So in summary, dry AMD, and this thing got to do both dry and wet. Dry AMD is very common. It's gonna, if you do retina, I think at this point in time, it's 80% of my practice, or no, AMD is 80 to 90% of my practice. Dry AMD is very common with age, and the risk factors are age and smoking, and the genetics, you probably need to know the complement factor H and that other gene. You see drusen pigment abnormalities and geographic atrophy. There's AREDS classifications, and then vitamins are recommended in a healthy diet. And um, I don't typically follow dry AMD as a red. I don't see any reason to see people back yearly. And, I, and the other thing with dry AMD patients, there's some question about how often they should be seen. That's where people do that risk of progression. What the, what, the, what the genetic testing people would say is, you get the genetic test, and then you know you need to see them every three months or every six months. I just try to educate people on the grid. And I can't tell you how many people come in with three to six months of vision loss, even though when you've seen them. And, the, and you say, why did you wait three to six months? I, at that point, it's too late to be mad at them. But you try to say, please, if there's any change. And the other thing is, everybody with AMD, their vision's going to fluctuate. So they're going to have good days and bad days. So what I always tell them, if there's a big change call, if you're not sure, it's OK to wait two or three days. If it's a little bit worse, just come in. If it's going up and down, that's standard. Um, okay, last thing is most people with dry AMD will see it, it once it gets to a certain point in low lighting, they won't see well. They lose the, so they'll see a dark spot in their central vision in low lighting. So you also will get people who come in having seen that and it's just dry AMD.